Good evening and welcome. I'm going to ask everyone to, uh, again, follow our instructions. Please respect our, uh, our guests and invite our speakers up to the stage and take their positions on the panel. Um, when doing so, i introduce myself. My uh, English name is Darren Thomas. My uh, Ongwehongwe name is uh, Yon Jaseyam, Seneca Nation Bear Clan. I'm a doctoral student at uh, Laurier and a uh, lecturer in the Indigenous Studies program at uh, the Brantford campus of uh, Laurier University. It's my honor and privilege and pleasure to be your moderator this evening and uh, to officially uh, welcome everyone to territory. I'm going to uh, offer a brief uh, welcome in the language. <clears throat> Genu Gadagi, Hariya Yakyono, Ne Dukinyanido, Ne Scano, Donotanyo, Nadi Nain Dwe Hek, Ichia Scotton Dwyer, Agwatni Goha. Don and Dwa Trui Genu Gadagi, Hariya Yakyono, Ne Dukinyanido, Ne Scano, Donotanyo, Nadi Nain Dwe Hek, Dieti Nohonyo, Hariya Yakyono, Dukinyanido, Ne Togan, you talk, Agwatni Goha. Don and Dwa Trui. Said Gowana, Scanna Dayo, Oi Hawana, a touch what's up, nay to say hi white, what? Sat Nasago ye hake on hand, oh, a wendan friend in Yogi, Nady named Dway hake, the said one no honio, said Gowana, Scanna Dayo, nay to gain your talk, oh, what Nigoha. Don and our true we, how her gate go hid at her non great so great so, nay so to sando, nay scan out, I don't know the yum, Nady named Dway hake. The said one no honyo, gau hide hanang great sugai diso, ne to gain your talk, o guatni goha. Down it turned a gat green, eke, I get that, gano honyo. The words there that I offered for us uh, this evening, uh, whenever we gather on territory, as uh, Hotasoni, one of the important things that we do is to try to center our minds. So I. Uh, it's a deeply rooted uh, philosophy, the understanding and uh, Hotasoni thought and philosophy that centers around a good mind. That everything that we're striving to do when we gather for ceremony or business or any kind of uh, event, we make sure that we start, put our minds in the same place. Uh, and as we're on our, our territory, it's a shared territory of the Anishinaabe and uh, neutral peoples. And, and uh, Haudenosaunee are the modern stewards of the Grand River uh, territory. So with that in mind, uh, putting our minds together and talking about some of these very critical issues that we're faced as we're looking to coexist amongst uh, indigenous and settler society. And it's an important part that we uh, uh, have some critical dialogue and learning on, on these issues that are in front of us. And although they're very hard uh, and they're tough to go through and some of this history that we've shared hasn't been very nice and it causes a lot of hurt feelings even for indigenous and, and settler society to look back at much of this history. The important thing to keep in mind is that we can carry this burden in the hopes that our great, great children, the ones not even born yet, don't have to carry it. That we have to go through this hard work in creating this vision of what it means to actually coexist as indigenous and settler society. So with that, I know you didn't come to hear me speak, so I'm gonna uh, be quiet and I'm gonna invite uh, our keynote to the stage. I have a few words to introduce him first. So Romeo uh, Shaganash is a member of the House of Commons. He's the first Aboriginal MP elected in Quebec. He represents the 
a B2B uh, by James Nunovic EU. I'm gonna, sorry, I know. See, even we have problem with other <laughs> nations, right? Romeo has served as NDP critic for the Energy and Natural Resources, International Development, and as deputy critic for Intergovernmental Aboriginal Affairs. He has advanced a private member's bill, Bill 262, an act to ensure that the laws of Canada are in harmony with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Please welcome to the stage, Romeo Shogunash. I've also been asked to let you know that uh, we are uh, live streaming the event and there will be a photographer going around taking your pictures. So if you uh, really don't want to be on film or evidence that you were here, then cover your face. <laughs> James <laughs> Negan, Chizi Putzman U Tabajmun Chepitzman Chedepskats Miguesh Mishwets did no Chenskumden Kavich Peter Keen Ut Tichich. So you probably understood that uh, those were words of greetings and Cree and thanks. And thanks, of course. I'm very uh, honored to be here this evening, especially in the light of the fact that uh, if people knew where I came from and the, the journey that I've had since I was born in the early 60s on the shores of a lake called Michigamish. I was born under a tent, literally, on the land. And when I ran for, for the leadership of the NDP after late Jack Layton passed, throughout the country, the most important question that people ask me throughout the country as I traveled to be the leader of the NDP was, what the hell is this? An indigenous person named Romeo. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the story, and not, not too many people know this anecdote. Well, two, hour, two hours after I was born, on the shores of that beautiful Lake Michigamish, well, we call it Michigamish, it's not the official name on the map of uh, Quebec, but uh, Crees call it Michigamish, have called it Michigamish since 7,000 years. Two hours after I was born, a float plane had to stop at our camp because there was a huge storm coming from the north. So they noticed three tents along that lake, and they said to themselves, let's stop here, wait out the storm, and then continue further north, further north afterwards. <laughs> 
the name of the pilot was Romeo. <laughs> so my mom gave me that name because, because of that Romeo, Romeo Julien in French. In any case. So I'm invited to talk about the, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, an international human rights instrument on which uh, I worked on along with some of the people that will, you will hear tonight as well. Uh, for, for the most part of it, uh, I guess, uh, when our UN ambassador, Cree UN ambassador, the Cree had a, a UN ambassador for a long time. Uh, and Ted Moses asked me in June of 2000, uh, 1984, asked me to come along with him to the UN. He said, you don't have to do anything, just observe, just watch how we do it, and maybe you'll like this, this work, which I did in 1984. And I tagged, tagged along for the rest of the time that this process lasted from 1984 to 2007 when the UN General Assembly adopted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, September 2007. But there's more to this story than just that and the challenges that we face throughout the process whether or not indigenous peoples or peoples, whether if they are peoples, do they have the same right of self-determination as other peoples under international law? Uh, what about the lands, territories, and resources, uh, traditional lands, territories, and resources of these peoples? These were all the challenges that we face throughout that period. But the story is beyond that. I was born on the land, literally. Spent the first seven years of my life on, out on the land, surviving, living with my siblings, father and dad. And the language that you heard, that I just spoke, it's the only language that I heard and spoke for the first seven years of my life. And people wonder why I think it's important for indigenous members of parliament to be able to ask their questions in their language, do their speeches in their language, and make their statements in their language. When I got elected in 2011, that was the first thing I asked. I went over to the clerk. I said, can I ask my questions in Cree during question period? Can I do my statements in Cree? Can I do my speeches in Cree? in the house? And the answer was no. She, sh uh, she said, it was a she at the time I got elected, she said, well, unfortunately, sir, the official languages of this place and this country is French and English. So, but I said, how can that be? My language has been spoken on this land for more than 7,000 years before even a French word or an English word was heard on this land. How is that not possible? So when we speak about reconciliation, 
in this country. Those are the kind of tiny things, little things, that we always forget about. I'm hoping, because this is my second and final mandate as a member of parliament, so I'm hoping to leave that place in about a year and a half now. Hoping to leave that place without any single indigenous person elected to that place having to fight for their right to speak their language in the house of the peoples of Canada. The other aspect of all of this story is, of course, residential schools, right? I was taken away when I think turned seven, because we're never sure of the year we were born when we live off on the land and off the land. So my parents were never exactly sure what, what year I was born. I'm in my mid-50s, mid I think, <laughs> right now. And uh, so I spent 10 years in a residential school in central Quebec. The Latuk Indian Residential School, as it was called, 10 years. There were 14 of us in our family And purposely, of course, they separated, separated us. Some were sent to Brantford. Some were sent to Sault Ste. Marie. I was sent, along with two, two others, to Latuk. And the first one that was sent away in 1954, John Ish never came back, died the first year in residential school. It took my mother 40 years to find out where he was buried. It took 40 years to find out whether or not he really died in residential school. It was by accident that my sister, who was a reporter for CBC North back then, by accident that a nurse ran to her while she was in Moose Factory, saying, are you Emma Saganash? Did you have a brother named John? And she said, yes. And she said, I know where he's buried. 40 years. I often saw my mom weep, cry. I never saw her cry that way that day when she found out. So many of the stuff that indigenous individuals throughout this country are trying to achieve is not for the benefit of only indigenous people. No. It's for the benefit of all of us. Reconciliation is not about, not about me, my people. Reconciliation is about us. How do we change this country in order to better represent what this country is all about? It's not just about the settlers coming in and the story starting there. 
there are peoples here. They have stories. They have traditional territories. They have traditional, they still do, ways of life. So when I came out of residential school, and I say this often, I sought to do two things. Because I had been incarcerated physically, emotionally, spiritually, linguistically. I thought, I said to myself when I come out, I want to go back to the land. Which I did because one of the most difficult moments every single year in residential school was this time of the year. When the geese start flying over us, over the residential school, I know where the, I knew where those geese were going to my land, to the traditional territory. And I knew how my family was probably preparing to meet and feast because of the arrival of the migratory birds to the north. So every night, every morning, every day, during spring at residential school, I would hear them. I would hear them and say to myself, I wish I could be there because that is who I am, because that is the Cree in me. But it did not happen for 10 years. So when I came out, I went back to the land, spent two years out on the land, hunting, fishing, trapping, living the way I lived for the first seven years of my life. But the other thing that I promised myself when I came out of residential school was to try to reconcile with the people that put me away for 10 years. And I knew it was going to be a long journey. It still is a journey. I may, I may be a member of parliament. I may have a different status as many people in this country as a member of parliament. But it's still a journey. So when I got elected in 2011, I'll spare you the part uh, about the reason why I went to law school. That's a funny one too, but uh, that's, that's, I'll save that for another day. But I did want to do something about our relations, indigenous and non-indigenous in this country. So I thought that one of the better ways of doing that exactly was to learn the laws of this country, learn the laws uh, internationally, and how all of this can benefit us as peoples, but also us as neighbors in this country. In 2012, I introduced uh, a similar bill as Bill C-262 today. 
I think it was 641. Bill C. 641. Which I fought for uh, during my first term as a member of parliament. The reason why I want our laws to be consistent with international norms and standards is because that's, that is our obligation as a country and as parliament. So I proposed the bill back then in my first term, got voted down by the conservative government. Conservatives voted in block against Bill 6, C641. So it got defeated on second reading by 17 votes because of that. At that time, the Liberals, the NDP, Green, and Bloc voted in favor of that bill. <coughs> Sorry. But everybody knew that uh, if I got reelected in 2015, that I would come back with something similar. But the important development that happened between the first bill during the 41st parliament and this bill during this 42nd parliament uh, was the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that came down with 94 calls to action. Calls to action 43 and 44 are under the heading Reconciliation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. 44 calls on the government and in collaboration with indigenous peoples to develop a national action plan for the implementation of the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But 43 says this. 43, call to action 43 calls on the government of Canada, the provinces, the territories, and the municipalities to fully adopt and implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as the framework for reconciliation. As the framework for reconciliation. So no government today can say, especially because all of the provinces and, and political parties have said we accept the, uh, the calls to 94 calls to action, except the Conservatives. Uh, they have slight problems with certain of the calls to action. But um, all parties have said during the last campaign that they accepted all 94 of them and that they would implement all 94 of them. I was part of the last federal election campaign. I listened carefully to every single promise that the Liberal government made to Indigenous peoples, especially in regard to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Granted, granted, the, one of the most difficult things in politics in Ottawa is to deliver on a liberal promise, but that's, but that's something else I can, I can talk about further, but, but this is one of the key promises, in my view, that Justin Trudeau made to Indigenous people to adopt and implement the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So I thought that I stood on solid ground when I proposed Bill C-262 because they had made that promise. The Truth and, Reconcil Truth and Reconciliation Commission has called for it. So I said, yeah, this shouldn't be a problem for the federal government, the new federal government to accept. Well, it took 
two years of convincing. I traveled this country from the East Coast to the West Coast for more than eight months. Town hall meetings, responding to questions from the public, both indigenous and non-indigenous, throughout the country. Every single time I walked out of a town hall meeting, the support for Bill C-262 was overwhelming. Overwhelming. Everywhere. So our multiple indigenous and non-indigenous organizations support Bill C-262. Multiple indigenous and non-indigenous communities have adopted resolutions of endorsement of Bill C-262. Because this country believes not just in reconciliation. This country believes in justice. There cannot be reconciliation in the absence of justice, as I like to say. That is our road, our roadmap. I think even the Secretary General of the UN mentioned that. This is our roadmap, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So I'm thankful that the present government finally decided to support Bill C-262 on second reading. The bill is now in committee for further in-depth study with witnesses that we've been having and will continue to have till, till May. And I'm hopeful that it's going to come back to, to the House for third and final reading and its adoption. Bill C-262 is, is the first legislation in this country that explicitly rejects colonialism. In the history of this country, no other legislation has explicitly done that. Bill C-262 is perhaps the first, is, is the first legislation in the history of this country that would have recognized that spiritual relationship that we have with our lands, our territories, and our resources. Bill C-262 is the most important piece of legislation that the Parliament of Canada will have to consider in a long time. So I'm proud of that journey that uh, has led me from Michigamish, Sakigan, as we say in Cree. Sakigan is lake. To where I get the privilege and honor to stand once in a while. Still speak the language without permission. I don't need permission at times. So this is where we are at this point. Let me just briefly, um, I'm not, I haven't checked my time, but uh, just briefly talk about uh, the hearings that we've had so far in committee on Bill C-262. I always say that uh, The rights that are enshrined in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples are human rights. I can safely say, because I've participated over the last 30 years in that discussion, that the UN 
system has considered the rights of indigenous peoples as human rights. So Bill C-262 is not just about reconciliation or justice, but also about the human rights of the first peoples of this country. And they are human rights. And they are said to be inherent in the sense that these inherent human rights exist because we exist. We are still here as peoples. So one must wonder, in a place like Canada, one of the richest, most richest countries in this world, in 2018, one must wonder why these are debatable, even debatable. I, as a member of parliament, fully aware of my duty as a member of parliament and my duty to uphold the rule of law every time I consider a piece of legislation in that place. That is my role and that is my duty to always uphold the rule of law and human rights. So I still find it to this day appalling that there would be politicians and members of parliament among the 338 that challenge our human rights, that deny that our fundamental rights are human rights in a place called the Parliament of Canada. I find that appalling, I find that unacceptable. And we should hold all of our MPs, all of them, whether they are NDP, Conservative, Green, or Liberal, to that rule. You see, I've come to understand what the rule of law is. Not because I'm a jurist, but because that is my role as a member of parliament. The rule of law doesn't just mean sending in the army or the police to bring down a barricade that indigenous peoples have raised in the protection, in the name of protecting their lands or waters. That's not what it means. Upholding the rule of law means respecting the Constitution. And in our Constitution, of course, there is the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but also Section 35 that recognizes and affirms Indigenous Aboriginal and Treaty rights. So whenever I get up in that house, always mindful of that role and duty that I have, not just on behalf of indigenous peoples, but on behalf of all Canadians. Respecting the rights of indigenous peoples is good, not just for the environment of this country, but for the economy of this country. I can safely say, over 40 years of experience in Northern Quebec, whenever there was an agreement, and there's, there has been over 80 agreements signed with my people in Northern Quebec, every time there's an agreement signed in Northern Quebec with the Cree, everybody in Quebec is happy because it's good for their, their economy as well. And this is what these kind of instruments are meant to do, to forge 
that meaningful relationship that we need to have with indigenous peoples. I traveled, as I said, this country promoting Bill C-262. And it has received widespread support. There were walks organized. One of them started here, all the way to Ottawa, 600 kilometer walk. I see one of them walkers in the, in the room t tonight. And uh, petitions were signed. Even poetry books were written about the UN Declaration. So the Mennonite Church of Canada commissioned two poets and asked them to write a poem for each of the 46 articles of the UN Declaration. Lifting hearts off the ground, it's called. And I want to read, see I'm getting old, I have to take off my glasses. I want to read what one of them wrote about Article 46, which is an important one in the UN Declaration. It's about international law, of course. And, and I always tell indigenous leaders and, and people, if you're claiming your right to self-determination under international law, then you need to accept all of the other rules under international law. And that's what our Article 46 is about. So in Article 46, one of the poets wrote, Time will tell the course of our collective. We are one in the end. Some are parrots, some are falcons, some are cranes, and some are pigeons. But at sunset, we are all birds, needing a place to roost, a nest to shield us from the winter wind, see me in you, see you in me. We will learn this third, this hard lesson together. Some will starve, some will overeat, some will freeze, some will overheat, recycled souls evaporate then drop against the parch, canvas on the earth, smelling like sweet aspiration of a tr trillion lives lived. Love sustains us. Love recreates us. Love remains after all the blood and all of the pain. Love remains. Love remains. When superiority is silenced, beauty is seen. Movement, risk, relationship, love, in communion, movement, in vulnerability, risk, in hearing, relationship, in sharing, love. Let us be who we were created to be. There's, a, there's an afterword written by a loved one. Her name is uh, Leah Gazan. I told Leah about the story For 20 years, I lived in Quebec City as a director of government relations and international affairs for the Grand Council of the Cree. 
And every Saturday, I would drop by the flower shop and buy myself flowers. Something that the owner didn't know. She thought that these flowers were for somebody else every Saturday for 20 years. And when I got elected to Parliament in 2011, I told her that I was leaving, that this is perhaps my last bouquet that I would buy from her. And she said, well, I guess she's going to be sad not getting flowers anymore on Saturdays. I said, no, the flowers were for me. No one buys me flowers. She wept and offered me the bouquet. So I told that story to Leah, who is my partner now. And she wrote this in the afterword of this beautiful poetry book that I invite you to get. And she wrote, title, the poem, The Flower. He said he never received flowers, a blossomed heart, an orchid to be cherished. He said he never received flowers, a spirit they tried to break in residential school. Behind walls that grew weeds of genocide, there were no flowers. They had no flowers for an artist's spirit whose creativity was born out of kindness. He said he never received flowers, a spirit so worthy to be embraced by kindness and love. So here's your flower. Let the smell, smells fill your room with the beauty of your sacred heart. Leah Gazan. I think I'll leave it there. Miigwech. <clears throat> Yeah, anyway. so um, I think at this time we're going to invite our panel up. So please welcome them to the stage. And just to uh, update you, unfortunately, uh, uh, Daly Sambadoro uh, had some uh, difficulty with her flight out of Alaska last night. So. Uh, uh, we asked uh, Dr. Peggy Smith uh, to fill in. So, uh, I don't know who, do we have an order? Do we set an order? Yeah, I'll go last. <coughs> go last? <laughs> so I'll introduce everyone and then they can fight over who's going to go. But I'll start with Peggy since she's going last. <laughs> so uh, uh, Dr. Smith is uh, uh, Professor uh, Emer Emerita <laughs> in uh, Lakehead University's Faculty of Natural Resources Management. She leads a stream on First Nations, Métis, and local community engagement for the Center of Excellence in Sustainable Mining and Exploration. She is currently working on two FPIC projects, one a case study in Northern Ontario for the Pan-American Indigenous Rights Governance a Network, and the other on FPIC in the forest sector. She also helped to develop the FPIC requirements for the new uh, Forest Stewardship Council and uh, Canadian National Standard. 
to my uh, immediate right here is Paul Joff, who's an attorney who has, since 1974 has specialized in human rights and other issues relating to indigenous people at the international and domestic level. For over two decades, he's been involved in international standard setting processes, including those relating to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The draft American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and the Indigenous and Tribal Peoples Convention, 1989. In 1998, he was involved in the Quebec Succession uh, Referendum, acting on behalf of the Grand Council of Decrees before the Supreme Court of Canada. He's a member of the Quebec and Ontario bars. And lastly, on the far right is Jose Elwin, who's a human rights lawyer with study at the Faculty of Law at the University of Chile in Santiago and at the School of Law at the University of British Columbia, where he obtained a Master in Laws degree in 1999. He has researched and published on human rights, ethnic and cultural diversity, and environmental rights in Chile and the Americas. He teaches Indigenous people's rights at the School of Law at the <coughs> Universidad Austral de Chile. Uh, he currently acts as co-director of the Observatorio. Uh, I'm gonna mess this one up too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nano, the Citizens Watch, a Chilean uh, NGO aimed at documenting, promoting, and protecting human rights. He's a member of the board of the National Institute for Human Rights of Chile, and he also acts as co-director of the Pan American Indigenous Rights and Governance Network. Please welcome everyone our panel this evening. It looks like you, Paul. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Of course, this is a very hard act to follow, so you know, I won't even try. Uh, but I would like to reinforce some of the comments that uh, Romeo mentioned. And I'd like to start with human rights. And um, it's important to know that for over 35 years, uh, indigenous people's human rights, indigenous people's rights have been considered or addressed as human rights within the international human rights system. And also, it was, I believe, the 18th of June 2007 when the uh, UN was reforming their human rights system. They adopted a resolution, and in it, they had their the Human Rights Council, which was a new body at that time, uh, to, um, they discussed what its agenda and program of work would be. And under that agenda and pro program of work are human rights. And they referred to the usual economic, social, cultural, political human rights, including the right to development. But then they added as well that that includes the rights of peoples, specific <laughs> groups, and individuals. So in fact, while a lot of people, and you may hear it today, I heard it recently by a certain lawyer uh, in BC, that indigenous people's rights aren't really human rights. And so you get this huge discrepancy, there's no substantiation but what Romeo is talking about is a reality for the past 35 years within the international human rights system. And so I'd like to turn now to a quote in Chilcotin Nation versus British Columbia in, in 2014. And that, of course, was, that, was the first time the Supreme Court ever recognized title for an indigenous nation in Canada. And in paragraph 142, I mentioned the paragraph in case there are students here that wish to follow this up. They indicated, the court indicated, that the Canadian Charter forms part one of the Constitution Act 1982. And the guarantee, as they called it, of Aboriginal rights forms part two. And the court went on to say that parts one and two are sister provisions 
both serve to limit the powers of federal and provincial governments. So it's very important, this parallel to sister provisions, and it makes sense. But when we look at the jurisprudence, uh, you'll find for part one that the Supreme Court has repeatedly said that when you're interpreting human rights under part one in the Charter, then the interpretation should be at least as great, and I'm quoting it here, at least as great a level of protection as found in Canada's international human rights obligations. Now, the court has never addressed part two rights, which are Aboriginal and treaty rights, as human rights. And um, if I think of one obligation that Romeo mentioned, which is in the right, and Jennifer mentioned it this afternoon, that the right of self-determination in Article 1, Paragraph 3, talks about the obligation of states, including Canada, and it's to respect and promote the right of self-determination. And that's been there, as Jennifer mentioned today, since 1976. So for over 40 years, uh, Canada has not respected its human rights obligation. And this, of course, relates to free prior and informed consent. So um, this, again, shows the importance of the UN Declaration. The UN Declaration should never have required, it should never have been necessary to affirm the right of peoples to self-determination. It was already in the covenants, so why repeat what is already international human rights law? But states insisted that indigenous peoples prove that they're under Article 1, and that's why you have Article 3 of the Declaration. But still, people do not want to accept um, consent, as you've heard this afternoon and this evening. So that's one issue, and I should mention another thing that occurs, and you see it. Whenever there's an issue in Canada, you never hear people talking, or ministers, or the press, or governments saying, yeah, we're, we're really concerned in, this, in regard to this new pipeline uh, the effects on the human rights of indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples' rights are just not characterized as human rights. And um, I'll leave this issue as one point, and I want, I'd like to go on to a couple of others. And the second is that there have been, as you probably heard, some extreme reactions to Bill 262, C-262. And they've said often, and you'll hear it again, that the Supreme Court has carefully balanced indigenous people's rights since 1982, very carefully. And if we start adopting Bill C-262, or this U new UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, that's going to upset the balance. And so they caution against it. And it reminded me of uh, two articles that I had read from this author. And his name is Ozan, O-Z-A-N, Varol, V-A-R-O-L. And it's on the subject, and I'm sure you haven't heard about it, of constitutional stickiness. And the reason he wrote it is that most people believe that if you play with the Constitution, meaning if you change it, it could have very far-reaching, unforeseen consequences. This could be ca catastrophic. You shouldn't touch the Constitution. Leave it alone. And so he did a a comprehensive study all around the world, even where there were revolutions in countries. And he found over and over that the Constitution 
never changed much. And when they went to interpret it, even after a revolution, you basically got pretty much the same interpretation. And that's what he means by constitutional stickiness. And even when there were provisions in constitutions that weren't very helpful, might have been anachronistic, it didn't matter. People were reluctant, or governments, to alter the Constitution. So they stayed with provisions in the Constitution that weren't helpful. And so now we have this opportunity to change the interpretation of the law, and also, without altering Section 35, we could give it real meaning, not by what the Supreme Court says, and believe me, I have great respect for the Supreme Court, but it's good to remember that when the Supreme Court developed most of its jurisprudence, it was before the adoption of the UN Declaration. So it never took it into account. So I don't blame totally the Supreme Court for just taking the words, you know, existing, uh, the Aboriginal peoples of Canada have existing Aboriginal and treaty rights, and they're recognized and affirmed. That's all they had. So they interpreted it. But I was involved in that negotiation, and I helped draft um, Section 35. And the reason we added and affirmed is because, as you've heard from speakers today, including Romeo, the rights are inherent, they're pre-existing. They're not being recognized, they're being affirmed. And we didn't want courts to interpret if we just said recognized that all they were doing was giving rights. So, um, so again, this becomes very important because as you follow this debate and you hear about the catastrophic effects, not from everyone, but from certain think tanks who claim that they've studied this carefully, um, one has to uh, sort of give it second sober thought. Now, a third issue I'd like to mention is vulnerability. Too, it's too seldom, and I can't even think right here on the stage, when I've heard the court deal with vulnerability. I can think of one case. It was R versus Ipili, where the court recognized, when it was looking at sentencing, that we have to take into account what happened to any particular indigenous person that's accused of a crime. And they said, you have to consider that there was colonialism in residential schools, etc. And so, to that extent, they came up with that Gladu rule, which is, you know, before you sentence, you need a, a record of what that person has been through, because there were a lot of injustices in indigenous people's lives. And um, so, you know, to me, the ones you know about in terms of creating this vulnerability is, of course, residential schools, colonialism, forced assimilation and destruction of culture, which is cross-cutting and can affect most of what indigenous peoples do or practice or their spirituality or um, their rights. And also Section 141 of the Indian Act, which existed between 1929 and 1951, and it uh, basically prohibited indigenous peoples for raising funds to hire a lawyer to defend their land rights. And um, that too um, was, you know, allowed all those years that this provision was in force. They had no access to courts. They had no right to an effective legal remedy. So this is just touching. I'm, not, I'm just scratching the surface here. But vulnerability should be a key uh, aspect. And I say it because in the, in the Charter, in the Canadian Charter, Section 15, it talks about the right to equality. 
But equality, substantive equality, includes the right to be different. And um, when you're different, you have to treat people differently. Because if you don't, then everyone will be assimilated to what the majority is. So women have different rights than men. Children have rights that adults do not have. Indigenous people's rights are different in one way, just picking one is collective rights. It's a different, different cultures, very different from what uh, you know, other Canadians have. And so, uh, to me, these are all elements that should enter into uh, Supreme Court judgments or at any level of courts. And the UN also says, the UN Declaration, I think it's preambular paragraph two, indigenous peoples are different, <coughs> have the right to be different and to be considered as such as, and respected as such. Um, so that's just affirming this right of difference. It's because it's not just that indigenous peoples are different from non-indigenous peoples, but if you're Cree or Ojibwe or Mohawk, you don't have to be like anyone else. Mohawks are Mohawks. Crees are Crees. Uh, you're allowed to be different. And so when you interpret the UN Declaration, those provisions are through the lenses of all these different indigenous peoples. And that contributes to the, to the cultural heritage of humankind. So it's not just for indigenous peoples. It's if you believe in human rights. It's if you believe in um, you know, treating people differently and changing fundamentally what has happened. Romeo mentioned colonialism, that it has to be repudiated. His bill also explicitly condemns doctrines of superiority, such as uh, doctrine of discovery and t t terra nullius. Now, this is a new. Doctrines of superiority and colonialism are also in the preamble of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. So, it's been there. It's not new. There are other instruments where these things have been condemned. Um, what, I think in 1970, a resolution was passed by the UN United Nations where they referred to colonialism as a crime. That's how they regarded it. And so, I beg your pardon? Crimes against humanity. Oh, crimes against humanity. <laughs> um, so, it's not radical what's happening now. It's totally essential. And what I am concerned about is that even if Romeo and others succeed in getting a perfect bill because of constitutional stickiness, it won't end up being what it should be. There'll be a reluctance from the courts to change their perspectives. And maybe they'll change it a little, but it's, we, I think we have to be, we meaning everyone, has to be vigilant that in fact, it's not going to be that easy. So I'll stop there, thank you. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge first the uh, Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people for allowing us to be here and um, thanking Dr. Terry Mitchell for inviting me to this um, panel. I feel very privileged to, to be part of this panel with Romeo Saganesh, whom I've known for a number of years. I invited him to Chile uh, in 2006, and he was at that time sharing the experiences of the Cree in, uh, in achieving their self-governance. And, um, and now he's uh, uh, leading the, the, the implementation of UNDRIP in, in Canada, and also privileged to be in the panel with other legal and uh, indigenous scholars. Uh, um, 
you can imagine that I'm not going to talk of Canada, because I'm, although I, I had the opportunity to study here and I made comparative analysis of uh, regimes, legal regimes of, of oppression, later on recognition through struggles of indigenous peoples, but I want to reflect on, on two issues in this short uh, time. W one is uh, sharing the, the challenges and the progresses that uh, have been made in the context of Latin America in the implementation of uh, UNDRIP. And on the other hand, what I visualize as a challenge for the full implementation of UNDRIP in Canada, taking into account the fact that Canada currently has a, um, a global dimension, particularly uh, with its role in uh, extractive investments uh, globally. And that uh, needs uh, or, or makes a, um, Make, makes it necessary to uh, analyze the extraterritorial obligations of Canada by implementing UNDRIP not only within the borders of Canada, but also making UNDRIP enforceably uh, abroad. So, um, you might not know that Latin America has 800 indigenous peoples of 45 million people, 10% of the population, a long history of dispossession, um, a long history of denial, which has been uh, changed in, in recent decades through a process of basically of indigenous struggles, as similar to the struggles in Canada. And, and as part of that struggle, uh, it, Latin American states adhered and voted in favor of uh, UNDRIP in 2007, <coughs> except for Colombia that initially uh, uh, rejected but later adhered to, to UNDRIP. And since then on, th there have been um, several uh, events, legal events, political events, uh, through which some progresses have been made in the implementation of UNDRIP. Uh, UNDRIP has been uh, very influential in constitutional reforms that have taken place in Latin America uh, after 2007, particularly um, the constitutional uh, reforms enacted with very active participation of indigenous peoples in Bolivia and in Ecuador in 2008 and 2009. These are the first states that declared themselves as plurinational states, Bolivia acknowledged the right to self-determination, the right to autonomy. Uh, it generated special representation uh, for indigenous peoples. Uh, it also the, the, um, acknowledged uh, rights to ancestral lands. And Ecuador recognized uh, the rights of good living based on the Quechua nation of Sumac Causay. Um, in many ways, these two constitutions were strongly influenced by UNDRIP. They wouldn't have been possible without UNDRIP. But at the legal level also, there's been a very interesting evolution, not only in these two states, but in many other states, where um, UNDRIP has been uh, uh, used to acknowledge particularly lands of traditional occupation. Uh, also, mechanisms of, of special representation, uh, the acknowledgement of, in, of indigenous legal systems within the court system. UNDRIP has been influential too in jurisprudence enacted by uh, higher courts or by constitutional courts since, since then. Uh, the Supreme Court of Belize invoked uh, in 2007 UNDRIP to protect the rights of the Mayan indigenous communities to their traditional lands. The Supreme Court of Chile invoked UNDRIP to protect Mapuche wetlands. The Constitutional Court of Colombia has been very active uh, and including UNDRIP in its jurisprudence, particularly uh, acknowledging FPEC on cases con considered by uh, UNDRIP, but also uh, 
on, on a situation which is not considered by Andrip, uh, which is large-scale uh, projects which have a major impact which could affect the integrity of the lands and territories of indigenous peoples. This is a, is a jurisprudence that uh, um, emerged from a case uh, of Saramaga versus Surinam in uh, at the Inter-American Human Rights System in 2007, also very much influenced by uh, the uh, by Andrew. Uh, as mentioned, the, the Inter-American Human Rights Court's jurisprudence uh, has uh, acknowledged Andrew. Uh, and even the, the draft declaration as part of what, what's called the legal corp or the corpus juris um, and has made several decisions based on, on UNDRIP provisions uh, um, on, as I said, on FBEC, also on the recognition of uh, lands, territories and natural resources on the basis of traditional occupation, which would be the, the concept of Aboriginal title in the Canadian context. And in, um, in uh, defining what are the meanings of uh, the rights to consultation and consent. So, um, UNDRIP was also uh, absolutely influential in the enactment and in the passing of the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2016. In most aspects, the American Declaration adopts the standards established by Andrew. In some aspects, however, the American Declaration is below those standards. For instance, it does not acknowledge FPEC uh, when uh, states uh, uh, allow the deposit of wa toxic waste on indigenous lands and territories. Uh, it also um, establishes that um, the regulation of indigenous uh, rights to lands, territories, and natural resources has to be in accordance with legal systems defined by states, which diminishes the standards of uh, UNDRIP. In any event, uh, as Paul Jeff has analyzed in, in, in his uh, writings on, on the American Declaration, which he followed actively, uh, the American Declaration has to be interpreted in light of uh, UNDRIP. And in any event, it cannot diminish or extinguish the rights that indigenous peoples uh, already had at the time of its enactment. Um, it is interesting that Canada, um, and we were talking about this prior to this uh, panel, uh, that, that panel, that Canada was part of the consensus uh, of the approval of the American Declaration. Uh, but Canada's statement on that occasion was very peculiar and relevant to this panel. Canada representative said, as Canada has not participated substantively in recent years in negotiation on the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, it is not able at this time to take position on the proposed text of this declaration. However, Canada is committed to continue working with our partners in the OAS on advancing indigenous issues across the Americas. It's a very ambivalent declaration. On the other hand, it has a commitment to, to the point that I, the second point I want to make, if I have the time, which is advancing indigenous issues across the Americas. Um, as you probably are aware, uh, Canada has um, played a very significant role in, uh, or Canada is a central player in global economy, and particularly Canadian mines are uh, present in most parts of the world. And one of the areas of the world where, where this uh, uh, Canadian uh, extractive industry uh, has proliferated in recent years is Latin America. Of the 4,300 projects carried out by these companies outside Canada, 1,500 were in Latin America in 2013. The Canada Brand Report, published by Justice and Corporate Accountability Project in 2016, identified incidents involving 28 Canadian companies 
in the period from 2000 to 2015 in Latin America, which resulted in 44 deaths, 403 injuries, and 709 cases of criminalization. Most of these investments and these impacts are on indigenous peoples. So, different human rights treaty bodies, including the, the Human Rights Committee and the Committee on the Elimination on Racial Discrimination, have already addressed the responsibilities of Canada um, in the respect for indigenous peoples outside the borders of Canada. They have observed the failure of Canada to prevent and punish these human rights violations and have recommended the government to adopt administrative and legislative measures and policies to meet its extraterritorial obligations regarding the violation of human rights, in particular of indigenous peoples, by companies domiciled in Canada acting outside the country. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has held three hearings on the accountability of Canadian mining companies and called Canada to adopt the same measures. Canada, unfortunately, until recently, ha had not heard these complaints. On the contrary, Canada has continued to foster these investments through credits of through uh, export development agencies, through trade agreements, recently signed a new TPP-11, uh, including three states in Latin America, and actively through di diplomacy. But there are some hopes, and one of those hopes is the announcement on the creation of the Ombuds person for responsible enterprise uh, to address the complaints and allegations of human rights abuses arising from a Canadian company acting abroad and to undertake fact-finding missions, monitor implementation of those recommendations and report publicly through the process. The three areas that this ombuds person will cover is the garment industry, the mining industry, and the oil and gas industries. And there is a second uh, reason to have hopes, and that second reason is what uh, uh, the, 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 the initiative in which Romeo Saganash is involved, the announcement made um, by the, the, the bill presented by Romeo Saganash and the announcements announcement made recently by the Prime Minister uh, expressing the willingness of his government to support Bill C-262 and uh, to make uh, the, the UN Declaration uh, and to align the laws of Canada with the UN Declaration. So, um, I hope that these reflections can be of help for the debate which is taking place in Canada today with regards to the impl full implementation of UNDRIP, particularly taking into account that uh, the challenges for Canada are not only domestic, but since the activity uh, uh, promoted by the Canadian state is impacting the rights of indigenous people so strongly abroad, I have talked of Latin America, but that's a reality which is common to many other contexts. Uh, I think uh, that that, uh, um, that um, dimension will have to be covered in the efforts to implement UNDRIP in the near future. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Jose and Paul. Uh, every once in a while, uh, I, f I feel like I've gotten a slap. And I think as Canadians, we like to think of ourselves as leaders in human rights. And a lot of our politicians spend a good deal of time when they travel around the world wagging their fingers at other countries and admonishing them about their failures to uphold human rights. So to hear about some of the things that are happening in South America and, and the leadership that's being taken by some of the governments of Latin America and recognizing indigenous rights should be a wake-up call for us. So I wanted to thank you for that. And um, it, it's making me think a lot about um, the work that I have done in both the forestry and the mining sector in Canada. So most of my career I have worked uh, to uh, address indigenous rights in natural resource development. 
uh, and to increase indigenous involvement in those sectors, to bring in the different worldviews of indigenous peoples and their knowledge systems. And um, one of the things that's become clear, and I think why your bill is so important, Romeo, is because it's requiring us to take a look at our laws and ensure that they're in compliance with the UN Declaration. And why is that important? And I think we need to understand a little bit more about our own legal systems. Um, and since I talked about this this afternoon, natural resources development is a provincial responsibility. So it's provincial legislation that covers the way we develop uh, our water resources, our forests, our, our minerals. And those laws are, um, all give uh, ministers the ultimate authority over decision making. And it doesn't matter what the, many of those laws say, in the end, the, that final authority rests with the minister. And my conclusion is that until we get to a place where we can have shared decision making, and that's where this concept of consent becomes so important, um, we are not going to achieve this principle or this concept of reconciliation that we have been talking about. And the, the, the principle or the concept of self-determination means nothing unless we are able to figure out a way of, of working together. So, and, and I just, um, I think that in Ontario, there is only one piece of legislation that has been passed that actually acknowledges Aboriginal and treaty rights, and that was the revisions to the Mining Act that took place in 2009. Um, and and that Mining Act now requires um, consultation with Indigenous peoples, but only in the exploration stages of mining. So prospectors still have the ability to go into Indigenous territories with no consultation to look for minerals. And it's only when the potential has become greater and you see the possibility of developing a mine that the consultation requirements kick in. But Again, in, even in that legislation, Indigenous peoples don't have the right to say no. Um, they have the right to be consulted, they're heard, and then that ultimate authority again rests with the minister to make the final decision. In forestry, um, we have an act, uh, a Crown Forest Sustainability Act, that has very common language around Aboriginal and treaty rights, and that's a non-derogation clause. So it's recognizing that those rights are out there, but it's saying this legislation doesn't have anything to do with those rights. It's not going to add to them or take away from them. And most of our legislation is like that. So just think about what it means to have a piece of legislation that requires us to look at all of our laws and go through them with a fine-tooth comb and see where they can be um, brought in line with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I, I don't think I ever thought uh, before I heard you tonight talking about how momentous that piece of legislation is, um, that it's the first of its kind in Canada to um, question our whole colonial system. Um, so I, th I think that, um, again, it's been an eye-opener eye for me to, to hear that and to realize the impact. So before I get to my final question for you, Romeo, um, the other thing I wanted to say is to, to thank you for reading the poem about Article 46. Um, I felt like it was for me. <laughs> and it was because uh, yesterday, uh, well, it, it started with my work on the Forest Stewardship Council, where we, um, it's a private voluntary um, system where forest companies who want to assure consumers that they're buying wood from well-managed forests, they get their little eco-label and you can go to Home Depot and feel good that you're buying this um, sustainably managed product or a product that's come from sustainably managed forests. 
So the new sta national FSC standards have language around free prior and informed consent and the requirements for companies who are getting certified and are operating on, in indigenous territories to seek out the consent of those communities. As far as I know, it's the first time in, in Canada that any system is actually trying to put that into practice. But we had some fascinating discussions around this and how to do it. And one of the things that came up in some of the language that we were looking at was one of my non-Indigenous counterparts wanted to have Article 46 referred to. And the reason, I, th I think the reason was, I'm not totally sure, but I think the reason was because Article 46 takes us back to the basic uh, United Nations uh, concept that the, na <coughs> the nation state is the ultimate. It's the nation state that rules, and when it comes to any kind of laws that we're going to develop, it's always subject to that recognition of a nation state sovereignty. So we're seeing the UN Declaration now acknowledging the right of indigenous peoples to self-determination, but it's still under that umbrella where the nation state is considered the ultimate authority. Just like in Canada, the minister is considered the ultimate authority. And so I think this person just wanted to feel like there was something out there. It was too raw to come out and recognize indigenous rights and self-determination and the right to say no, the right um, and the, the um, requirement to seek consent. Um, so, uh, thank you for the poem, because I, the poem to me said, um, this isn't what matters. Uh, there are other things that we need to do together, and one of them is love each other. <laughs> so, I'm being a real sap here now, but I think it's important to say those things. <laughs> um, so, my question uh, for Romeo would be, where do we go from here? How long is it, um, will the, the bill be in third reading? When does it come to a vote? And what kind of support do you need from us to make sure that this happens? Well, first of all, uh, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I want to thank all three uh, panelists for their, for their words of wisdom. Um, I started out in this business uh, in 1981 when former and late uh, Grand Chief of the Cree, Billy Diamond, hired me for the summer. Uh, so I've been around for a while. Uh, it, uh, it also reflects uh, the patience I have, at least, had to see uh, the realization of, uh, of my rights as, as an indigenous person. Um, so it's not, I'm pretty sure it's not going to change overnight, even with the adoption of uh, uh, Bill C-262 as uh, uh, the constitutional stickiness as uh, being one of the reasons. Um, so we're, the Bill C-262 is now uh, before the Standing Committee on Indigenous Affairs. Um, we'll be hearing witnesses, including uh, Paul Joff and others uh, in the coming, coming weeks. Um, we, we are trying to finish the study of the bill by early May, so that it will come back before Parliament for third and final reading uh, before uh, the summer uh, recess. Um, that's my hope. I think uh, that's, the, that's the direction that uh, uh, we're taking, at least. I'm very grateful of the support that was uh, expressed by the present government over this bill, um, although it took took them two years to, to realize that that is exactly what they promised. Uh, but they, I had to insist over the two years. And, and I have to say, it, it is not just the work uh, 
that I did throughout the country, consulting and meeting with indigenous and non-indigenous communities. It is especially the, the work uh, of people like uh, Paul and Jennifer and others uh, that, have, that they've been doing over the years uh, around the UN Declaration. It's the pressure that the, the grassroots people put on their own MPs throughout the country, not just, not just uh, uh, in Ottawa, but also uh, throughout uh, many writings across the country. Uh, there are peaceful sittings and, and donut and, and coffee uh, uh, being given to pass, passerby uh, in front of MP offices throughout the country. Because this is what Canadians want. It's not just me, it's not just uh, TNDP. Uh, it, this is what all Canadians want. All Canadians want both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. That's why this is working. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention during, during the presentation is, is the fact that um, there's the people that have been opposing, and I'm talking specifically about the conservative MPs who are opposing this bill and, and the UN declaration in general, uh, have been focusing on the free prior and informed consent and the requirement to seek free prior and informed consent from Indigenous peoples. Um, I've tabled officially the, the study that the expert mechanism on Indigenous uh, uh, People's Rights uh, tabled a, a study a couple of years ago, 2012, I believe, uh, that studied exactly the concepts of free, prior, informed, and consent. Um, I, was, I, was I was present throughout the process at the UN. Um, I don't recall any occasion during those meetings where the word veto was mentioned during the negotiations. Never. In fact, I don't even uh, recall any occasion where an indigenous pers uh, people or nation wanted to separate from the state where they are in today. I think the talk is about cooperation, respect, and partnership. Basic principles that should exist always. I also want to <clears throat> mention the fact that uh, you know, Bill C-262 is a very, very easy bill to read. It has six, six articles, including number one, which is the usual uh, short title of, of the bill. Uh, I invite you to read it. Uh, it's very, very straightforward. Um, this is what the Truth and Reconciliation has called for. We need a legislative framework. If we are, if we are to um, amend or rescind, for instance, the Indian Act, what do we replace it with? So that's up for discussion and that's fair. But at least Bill C-262 provides the framework and the minimum standards in terms of the right self determination of indigenous peoples. If we are to reintroduce uh, control of First, First Nations Control of First Nation Education Act in the future, the basic minimum standards are here with. That's what the bill does. It provides us with the minimum standards. And uh, that was the only purpose from the outset, and it still is uh, the purpose. Um, Secondly, one of the earliest comments that we, that we received during the uh, commencement of the study on Bill C-262 in committee was that it created uncertainty. Bill C-262 would create, apparently, uncertainty. I think it's the opposite. If there is something ambiguous and vague it's the whole concept of Aboriginal rights. What is contained in Aboriginal rights? Does it, does it include the right of self-government of Indigenous peoples in this country? 
We argued for a long time on that. Does it contain my right to speak Korean parliament? We can go on and on arguing the constitutional merits of that claim. But at least if we have a framework like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, here are the minimum standards that should apply to the, in terms of the human rights of Indigenous Peoples for their survival, dignity, well-being, and security as in the, in Indigenous individuals in this country. So when I said, after coming out of residential school, one of my missions was to reconcile with the people that put me away for 10 years, well, Bill C-262 is my extended hand to all Canadians. Thank you all very much. Um, at this time, we've got about 15 minutes left for the evening if anybody would like to ask uh, some questions. Um, but if you could please make your way down to the microphones so that we can all hear them. But uh, uh, I just want to offer some, some words uh, myself um, in greetings, uh, I think, uh, Everything we heard tonight, I think, has just been so tremendous and such a rewarding opportunity for me as a doctoral candidate that's got my head wrapped around all this stuff all the time and trying to make sense of it uh, in the hopes that I can help translate this for communities to help them make sense of this. Um, but, uh, you know, back home we'd say, you guys have big heads. <laughs> <laughs> Not full of pride, but just with that wisdom, right? So, here to the left. Hey, thanks. I'm uh, Stephen. And I have to say, as an Indigenous person, I'm very thrilled with what you're doing, Romeo. It's uh, great work for all of us, so I appreciate that, and for all of you for that matter. I have a three-part question, or really three separate questions, but they're all interrelated. Uh, the first question is for you, Romeo. So I've done a lot of transformation or strategy or culture change or whatever word you want to use. And when I go into building a strategy, I generally know what the downstream impact is going to be. So what is the end state for you with this? That's the first question. The second question is really for our legal experts. So you've seen this, you've heard Romeo, you've seen Bill C-262. So what do you see from the prog I guess, if you prognosticated what this would look like, what do you see the impact legislatively for us downstream? So five, 10, 20 years out, what do you see? So I'm asking you about the end state, the legal people about what do you see the change will be for us? Now the third question is really based on Paul and also Jose. So Paul talked about the stickiness and Jose's position was there's a whole lot of change that took place in 2007 in South America since it adopted UNDRIP. So I'm wondering, those don't really sort of jive almost from my perspective, what I heard. Thank you. You guys wanna start? <laughs> well, some change is easier than other change, and I'll mention something I think is easier in certain ways, and that is the Supreme Court of Canada, as I mentioned earlier, came up with some of these interpretations of Section 35 just based on what they thought. And so they came out with the duty to consult and, if appropriate, accommodate Indigenous peoples. But since then, as I mentioned, we have a UN declaration. So talking about change, the minimum standard in the UN declaration is not consultation. If you look at Article 38, it's consultation and cooperation with indigenous peoples. Cooperation 
includes a consensual element. If you and I are cooperating, we both have to have some level of agreement to go forward. So that's very different. And to add to that, the liberal government has said over and over, internationally and in Canada, that there are four elements or principles that govern their positions. And it's recognition of rights, respect, cooperation, and partnership. So again, that's one of the amendments that Romeo is contemplating. If the government says it, over and over, put it in the bill. If you are changing the whole perspective, put it in the bill. And as Romeo says, if you don't put it in the bill, you don't have that, that, that same uh, impetus to go forward. Now, also, the last preambular paragraph in the UN Declaration which is paragraph 24, preambular paragraph 24, <coughs> speaks of partnership, that the whole declaration should be looked at in the spirit of partnership. This again goes to a respectful and consensual relationship. So these are all very, to me, accessible if people are in good faith. And the other thing I'd mention, and people have mentioned it earlier today, is indigenous governance and laws. And that's just, uh, that issue isn't going anywhere. Uh, it's not going to be suppressed. It's going to grow. And it's going to dominate in many ways. It might take a little time. Now, when other governments, levels of government, uh, render decisions, no one says, oh, that's a veto. Well, when indigenous governments make decisions, it's not a matter of free prior and informed consent or veto. That's part of being a government. You make decisions and you use your own laws. So all of these things are, or elements are realities. They're not far removed. If the liberal government believes in the declaration, we have to move from consultation to consultation and accommodation. Same for the Supreme Court. They did it at a time there were no such standards. Now they are. So the Supreme Court should be using that as they do. They use international human rights standards for part one in the charter very regularly. Why don't they use the same standard and not discriminate against indigenous peoples in part two? So yes, I'm quite optimistic, even though I caution about constitutional stickiness, which is still a challenge. I believe there are many aspects, and we've only touched on some of them tonight. You know, there are limits in time. But um, the more we talk about it, the more we analyze it, I think there are a lot of, there's a lot of change that could occur, but it's got to be based on respect for indigenous peoples and also their governance and laws. Well, if I could add to your question, um, I mean, UNDRIP deals with many issues, all aspects of lives of indigenous peoples, ranging from political dimension, um, self-determination, autonomy, participation on states, territorial rights, lands, resources, uh, environmental rights, cultural rights, biodiversity, traditional knowledge, justice system. So um, the, the challenges in terms of a uh, adapting legislation to all of these areas is enormous. And that is very unlikely to happen. Uh, maybe some of the positive aspects of the Latin American experience is that some of these rights have been acknowledged in, in constitutions or in jurisprudence and, and generate a precedent. However, uh, due to time constraints, I. I did not refer to something that it, it is central to, to affirm. But notwithstanding those 
legal challenges and those jurisprudences, uh, there, there, there continues to be a huge implementation gap. Sometimes the laws are there, but they're not implemented. And uh, public policies continue to be, uh, and, and that's one area that, uh, that it's likely to happen here, even if Bill C-262 is approved. Public policies might continue to be contradictory. And, and what we've seen in Latin America is that on the one hand, there's been land demarcation, there's been a protection of, for instance, Colombia has one third of its territory has been declared a, as indigenous territory. However, uh, in the context of economic globalization, state policies continue to be aimed at resource extraction, and those resources are largely uh, in the territories of indigenous peoples. And th that's when the main contradiction continues to ha happen. So, um, just to say that, um, I mean, th hopefully uh, this bill will be enacted and it will generate a change. Uh, maybe not all the laws, probably not all laws will be adapted. Um, and in many ways, the struggles will continue to happen because, uh, um, I mean, there's, there's a gap between legislation and public policy. And Canada, Canada as a resource-based economy will continue to, 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 it's unlikely that it will change its, its e economy. Um, so challenges w are legal, but are, are also political. And, um, and uh, I'm sure that all of you here and Romeo is aware that that is the case in, in here too. Well, I guess, Thank you for, for your question, uh, because that's an important question uh, to me. Um, in the sense that, you know, having worked uh, uh, through the process of the UN Declaration for so many years, uh, this bill basically allows me, as an individual, to complete the circle and finish what I, uh, what I started doing from the outset in 1984 with the Grand Council of Korea at the UN. Uh, that's one thing. The, the other thing that is also very important for me, as a jurist, and I have noticed this for, for a long time, the government of Canada throughout the history of this country has constantly and always been an adversary to indigenous peoples and their rights and their status throughout the 150 years of our history, always. I don't know of a single case where the government of Canada stood by indigenous peoples in court and say, we agree with them, we stand by them. Never. In our present legal system, under Article 4.1 of the Department of Justice Act, the Minister of Justice has to make sure that any legislation before it is introduced in the House of Commons has to be consistent with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Well, guess what? Bill C-262 will have the same effect with, with respect to Indigenous peoples' rights in this country. That's another benefit of having this. We ended up in court all the time because of the vagueness, ambiguity of such a concept of such a concept as Aboriginal rights, because we always disagreed on the content. This bill has the merit of clarifying what our fundamental human rights are from here on. Although I believe, it, and Paul quoted the. Uh, the Supreme Court with respect to the sister provisions uh, uh, between the Charter and, and Section 35 in Part 2. Um, this should have happened all the time. The Minister of Justice should have made sure, make sure every time that any legislation is, is consistent with 
Aboriginal rights and treaty rights in this country. It never happened. This bill will do exactly that. And that's the kind of contribution that every member of parliament in this country should stand up for. No, I'm, I've said before I got elected in 2011 that I'll try to do two mandates. I'm at the end of my second mandate. I'll move along, but I'm hoping that uh, this will contribute to a better understanding, but certainly partnership between Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous uh, peoples and governments in this country. Thank you. And, the right and uh, just, just to add, uh, uh, there has been much focus on free party and informed consent, but uh, uh, everybody seems to forget that uh, Article 2, Paragraph 2 of Bill C-262 says this, nothing in this, in this act shall be construed as delaying the application of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in Canadian law. It already has application because we exist. We are here. We have those rights inherent. So I think uh, uh, that's an important article in my view, and Article 3 is also almost to the same effect, but uh, uh, I think we need to realize that and start working uh, with those lands from here on. Thank you. Hi there, my name... Is this working? Okay. Yeah. Hi there, my name's... Oh, that's loud. My name's Zafia, and I'm an undergraduate student at Laurier. Um, and I'm in global studies, so we're constantly learning about the natural resource depletion and the growing effects of climate change. So I guess my question is, over your 30 plus years in public policy, how has climate change impacted Indigenous communities and do you think this will have an impact on the realization of UNDRIP in Canada and abroad? Thank you. Who wants to take a while? Um, I, uh, I've had a, a PhD student do a, a study on First Nation perceptions of climate change in the far north. So this would be in far north of Ontario in the Treaty 9 area. And there are uh, huge implications uh, in terms of uh, food security, transportation, housing, uh, the ability to carry out traditional activities on the land because um, people have observed so many changes, but not just observed them, but have suffered consequences. So things like trucks going through the ice when the, when the winter roads are melting because the season has become so warm. Not the case this winter, mind you, but uh, in general, over the last 10 years, that's been the case. Or people following traditional um, patterns across the landscape to go hunting or fishing. And in the winter, um, those landscapes changing because of changing ice forms and things like that. So I think there are, there are huge implications for the communities. One of the big gaps that was uh, that's obvious is that those communities want, again, some decision-making authority over what happens in their territories to address climate change. And they are missing from almost all of the climate change policy tables. So that Indigenous voice is not being heard and will we'll suffer the consequences of that because I think that people who are on the land and observing those changes have a lot to offer and, um, in terms of developing policy. Okay, well that brings us to the end of our, our scheduled time. We actually went a couple minutes over, but let's give our panel a round of applause again. And uh, just as a way of wrapping, uh, I know we had some gifts out there, uh, so if you didn't get a chance to grab them, make sure you grab them. This is part of our, our work here in the Pan American Indigenous Rights Governance Network. And we actually uh, started at Laurier, and we approached the Six Nations Polytechnic a few years ago in partnership and said, hey, you want to change the world? And they said, you guys are crazy. You don't know what the heck you're doing. And, and what we pr promoted was a development of an FPIC website. 
and the idea of mobilizing this knowledge, that's the most critical piece as we've come to understand. And so we've actually, uh, we started out with a, uh, a student from our program in a user experience design and he created a website uh, based on its maximized utility for the end user. So go and check it out and, and it's uh, fpic.info um, and we've collected numerous articles that we've archived and research and case studies and we've had our students going through them and vetting them and, and they're categorized in terms of uh, uh, how accessible it is and what it's for and what it's about. Uh, it's in English and Spanish. It's currently being translated into French and with the hope of eventually putting it into indigenous languages as well. Uh, so check those materials out. And uh, Rebecca and uh, some of her staff are here from uh, De Yohahage, which is the Indigenous Knowledge Center. So I want to acknowledge them as our partner in this work and uh, supporting the ongoing growth and and the hope to be the Center for Excellence of uh, uh, Indigenous uh, Rights and Governance located at Six Nations. And uh, I wanna invite uh, Jennifer up on stage as well um, to be acknowledged. Uh, she was a guest with us this afternoon. We had a full day planned. Um, and so we had an event this afternoon at the university and Jennifer uh, along with uh, Courtney and myself spoke about our work and research. So please join our distinguished panel on stage. Uh, Terry, uh, would you like to come up and help me uh, hand out some gifts for our guests? So Jennifer, again, phenomenal work and the work that she's been doing on behalf of Indigenous people's rights for a number of years. So please, again, acknowledge our, all of our distinguished guests. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.